The first uh, thing that I want to do quickly is to just go through the outline of what we're going to do. We're going to run through quickly the goals for today's webinar, what you guys hope to get out of it and what I think would be good um, to share. We're going to go quickly through the role of the Commissioner and how her work actually relates to participation and how important it is. We're going to go through the participation guidelines which is the publication that the Commissioner has produced on how to engage children and young people in projects. Then I'm going to run through um, a few examples of participation projects and initiatives that government departments and, uh, um, and not-for-profits have, um, have conducted with young people. There's a sharing session at the end. We'll just sort of, um, we'll see how that goes. We've got a lot of space um, in between all of the slides for discussion. So we'll see how that goes at the end. There might be some people who have particular experiences with projects and have, a, have a experience that we can build on um, and that we can share with each other, so that would be good. And then there's also an evaluation in which I hope you'll be kind, but I would be really keen to get your feedback. Um, I know that we had a problem at the beginning. That's, that's really that's unfortunate but I'd like some feedback on um, the content but also whether you think the message function was adequate for you, if it was a good way of communicating, um, those kinds of logistical things that relate to the webinar because we haven't actually done it before. So that would be really useful. So the goals are uh, what I hope to be able to share with you today. I hope to be able to tell you about some participation examples. I also would like to be able to have a discussion of the guidelines and as I said, be able to share some past experiences that you um, might have in your organisations with participation. We might have a chat about social media. The reason we've put that in is because in the workshop that we conducted it came up quite a lot. Uh, we actually will be running a workshop in November about young people and social, um, social media and how you can use social media um, to get the involvement of children and young people. So it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment so that's why we've put that in there. We've also um, We've also got an opportunity for people to share with us if there's something there that I haven't said that you would like to get out of it, then please let me know. Um, just also I want to make clear that this is designed as an introductory level workshop. It's really to go through the main principles and ideas for involving children and young people in the first instance. So recognising that people might have some prior experience but really this is an introductory level for people wanting to kick off a participation project. Okay, so the first thing that I want to talk about is just to quickly outline the role of the Commissioner for Children and Young People. She, um, the work of her office is governed by an Act, it's the Commissioner for Children and Young People Act. Um, she must um, have the best interests of children and young people at the heart of all of her work all the time. It's the primary consideration in everything she does. It's very, very important that, um, that, that, is, that that consideration is made. She also must give special regard to Aboriginal children and young people and children and young people who are vulnerable or disadvantaged in any way. So it is a broad mandate. Her work also must have regard to the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child, which sets out the rights to which every child is entitled. The Commissioner's main role is advocacy and to influence government. So she provides a mechanism through which children and young people can actually communicate um, directly to government and share their ideas. Just going to have a quick drink of water. And lastly, which um, which makes the work of the office even you know more interesting is that the Commissioner is an independent statutory office and she reports directly to Parliament. The Commissioner's responsibilities as they relate to participation. Firstly, the Commissioner must promote the participation of children and young people at all times. She also needs to encourage agencies to, to seek the participation of children and young people, which leads on to the next point and is the reason why she developed participation guidelines that can be used by other agencies. Um, and this is really about making sure that participation um, of children and young people is relevant and appropriate to children and young people's needs, their developmental abilities, their stages in life, all of those kinds of issues.
Does anyone have any um, any questions or comments at this stage before we move into the participation cycle? Looks like everyone's settled in. And okay, I'm going to move. Um, I'm going to move into the participation cycle. This diagram has come out of the participation guidelines publication and it's really a reflection of the fact that children and young people have unique insights and can offer lots of creative solutions and enrich the decision making process of organisations. The guidelines have been produced to, to provide some step by step information um, based around the participation cycle idea as well as some extra resources and examples. It's a really great publication with lots of information so I urge you to have a read if you haven't already. The participation of children and young people will always be enhanced if it includes the following steps which I'll go through. Deciding, preparing, doing it and following up. The first step um, is deciding and that is really about um, wanting and needing to have a clear idea of what you want to achieve in your project. The scope for involvement is really, really enormous. It can be as little as big or as you can imagine which I'll talk a little bit about later. There's some things that you might want to consider. Are you looking to improve a particular program or do you want to consult with children and young people to inform your policy development processes? Are you looking for a creative or innovative perspective on a really simple issue? Um, what will you do with the advice that children and young people give you? And what sort of timeline and budget do you have to allocate to this process? Also, before you embark on any project, you need to make sure your decision makers are on board. The second stage of the cycle is preparing and at this stage you need to consider whether your organisational and project plans refer to or acknowledge the involvement of children and young people in the first place. You also need to make sure that your organisation is really prepared to build a, a really respectful and meaningful relationship with children and young people and that you actually seek and respond to their feedback in a meaningful way. You also need to know which children and young people you're going to involve. Will it be those who are directly affected by your services? Is it a bit of a scope to get new members to your group or on a project? Um, is it an organised pre-existing group, a bit of a captive audience I like to say? Um, so going to a school or a sporting club or something like that, that can be a very effective way of consulting with an already um, a pre-existing group that has a relationship and has some structure and that, those kinds of things? Or will you simply open up this opportunity to all children of a particular age group? Um, the next crucial, crucial point, um, speaking from experience of working with the Commissioner's Advisory Committees, is having the support of adult coordinators who can work with these groups. And not just that, but also making sure that they actually have the capacity to assist you in what you need. You also need to consider how your methods and activities be, are appropriate to the age, background and interests of your participants. The third step is doing it. So this is all the nuts and bolts. You need to make sure your paperwork, your interactions and all of the ways that you communicate with children and young people are relevant, exciting um, and creative so that children and young people can connect and relate to them. You also need to find good child friendly venues and kids themselves will give you some good ideas about this. If possible, you need to give your participants actual responsibilities such as facilitating, setting up a meeting, those kinds of things that really promote um, ownership of a project. You need to be very clear about time frames and expectations. Um, children and particularly young people are busy, they've got lots of different competing demands. Um, they, their demands can change very quickly on their time so you need to be clear that um, what you want to achieve and what you want them to give you so that they can tell you whether that's going to be feasible. You also need to ensure that um, all your permission forms and photo consent forms and all of those legal issues are taken care of so that you know you can actually use the information that they provide in a meaningful way. You need to make sure also that, that, that the participants know who's going to be looking after them and who they can go to if they've got a problem. And lastly, you need to make it challenging but achievable so that you can reward success but not scare them off and make it, um, make it unreachable. 
The fourth part of the process, um, step four, is following up. This is about ensuring that you've got adequate resources to actually review and evaluate the project for your own internal purposes and also so that you can acknowledge participants for how they've contributed. So um, marking their achievements, a certificate of participation, um, all of those kinds of things. Being able to acknowledge them publicly is also very important whether it's on your website, through a newsletter, something like that. You also need to take note of all the feedback they give you and actually feed this back to the group. Um, you need to tell them how you're going to respond to their ideas and what you're going to do to address the things they tell you. How's everyone going? Any questions at this point? Okay, I think we'll move on. I'm going to move now into the participation examples. The four that I'm going to share with you today, the first one is uh, Fremantle Headspace's virtual tour. Uh, the next one is Lewis Horn, who's a community artist. He's Talking Couches project. The third example is the department's community's work uh, to pull National Youth Week together and the Serpentine Jaredale Shire's Youth Advisory Committee. So they're four sort of quite different examples. Fremantle Headspace is the first um, example that we're going to talk about. The virtual tour's goal was essentially to create a youth-friendly introduction to the service, a really non-threatening, personal um, but still private way of actually informa um, accessing information and being able to provide support to potential clients who didn't necessarily want to come to the shop front but wanted to know something about the service and what they could get out of it. The reason that they created the virtual tour was that the youth reference group who's been operating it at Fremantle Headspace and I think a lot of headspaces across the country actually identified the virtual tour as a medium that was appealing and accessible to young people. There was also a view among staff who put the project very much in the youth reference group's hands that if they were involved directly were actually involved in the making of it, the step-by-step -step making of it, there would be experimental headspace identified a number of benefits that uh, not only were for their young people but also the community and the service itself. So the benefits for young people was that it, it gave young people a voice and a sense of belonging. It provided new opportunities for skill development and for learning and it gave them um, some experience in peer marketing. The benefits for Headspace obviously were improved awareness of their services and promotion of their services. Uh, they actually got to do youth participation and strengthen their core values and what they really thought was important. Um, and the benefits for the community obviously were improved awareness of the service within a wider community context and also awareness of that soft entry point so that people knew where to go if they didn't want to go to the service itself. There were some barriers which um, I think in a lot of participation can be an issue. The big thing for Headspace was that there was a lack of diversity within the group so it was those really active engaged kids who came on board quite quickly. Um, often a lot of hard to reach kids don't actually get involved in processes like this. There was also sometimes a bit of a lack of understanding and motivation to accommodate group members' other commitments. So that really goes back to that issue of young people, you know, their involvement can be very fluid, it can go up and down, they can be managing lots of different competing demands, they often have transport issues, they're in that real space of, you know, they have to get around everywhere on public transport or rely on parents. So these can really be big barriers to their involvement. The good thing about um, about the Fremantle Headspace example was that the project team really were involved every step of the way. They um, developed and produced everything. Um, they planned, they wrote the script for the film, they actually did the filming, they presented and they provided feedback on the editing process. I'll actually send you the link for the, um, for the YouTube clip of the, of the virtual tour after this. Um, it's a really great little video and it gives you a good idea of the skills that the young people have been able to um, develop.
Okay. Are there any questions on that one before we move through? Okay, the next example um, is from Lewis Horn, who facilitated the Talking Couches project. The actual project itself, um, the Talking Couches idea has been around for a while, but it was really invigorated as a community arts project um, as part of the Perth International Arts Festival in 2011. Um, Lewis worked with three existing groups, so going back to that point, you know, um, a lot of people come to Lewis and they say, I want to consult with children and young people, can you, can you get me the children and young people, where are they? And Lewis always finds that quite, um, quite challenging, he sort of says, well, you know, it's really as easy as going to where the young people are. So that's what he did. He went to the Prospect Group, which is um, a group of young people from African backgrounds um, in the northern suburbs. He also went to the Indigenous Youth Support Services um, conducted out of Melville Senior High School, um, a bunch of year eight and nine young people. And he also went to Youth Reach South at the Coburn Youth Centre. So he had three existing groups. There were some challenges. Uh, transport was an issue for some of these young people. A lot of them were at risk as well, so they had some issues there that Lewis had to work very, very carefully with. There was also some issues with ongoing motivation and there was a bit of scepticism at the beginning with Lewis. It took him a long time to build trust and relationships with his young people but, um, but he really got there in the end and it was very, very successful. The benefits that he saw for young people were some really um, some practical skills. They learned how to upholster, they learned how to sew, they learned how to paint, they learned how to work together. They also invariably ended up sharing their personal experiences with Lewis, which is always um, a really great byproduct of, of things like this. Lewis is very careful to call himself a community artist. He's not a youth worker, um, but he just finds that engaging with kids in this way uh, is often a very, very good way of actually getting them to share their experiences and build their confidence. There were numerous benefits for the community as well. The couches have been displayed all over Perth and I'll tell you in a moment uh, where they're sitting at the moment, you can see them. Um, but the benefits for the community was that it gave the opportunity to connect to young people by listening to their stories. The couches basically all had audio devices built into them so you can sit on the couch, the kids record their stories onto an audio, um, onto an MP3 player and they actually sit inside the couch. You sit and listen to the kids' stories and it's very, very, um, very rewarding and inspiring to listen to these stories. So the community really got a good sense of that and they also got an appreciation for art in a public space. The kids were also recognised officially with a celebration. There was media coverage. It was a really high profile event. You can see the couches now. Um, the bunny couch, which was done by the Prospect Group. I'll show you a whole bunch of photos in a minute. They're really great. The bunny couch actually sits in the Commissioner's office in our foyer, so that's really wonderful to see that there every day. Um, the You can also see it, um, the boys indigenous the boys from Indigenous Youth Support Services at Melville Senior High School, their couch is there. Uh, and at the State Library you can see it and also at Youth Reach South I think um, those couches might rotate. So the Prospect Group did the bunny couch, the Indigenous boys from Melville did the car couch and Youth, Youth Reach South did the game couch. Go through a few photos now um, so you can actually see in action. So this is um, the young people ripping up the um, ripping up the couch and getting started. This is the beginning of the car couch, I think. This is the girls um, making. I think this is actually a basketball couch. This might have this wasn't one that was in the um, exhibition, but um, this was one that the kids worked on. So there you go. There's the basketball couch. The kids all came up with the ideas themselves. They had complete creative control, um, and you know it, they just look so good. These are the girls from um, the prospect um, from the prospect group. This is really really interesting. Lewis was telling the story that um, he 
obviously the kids did have creative control over what couches they wanted to make and the girls wanted to make a Playboy bunny couch. Um, so Lewis had a really sort of tense moment of trying to explain to them how that might not be appropriate. So he said that he thought there might be copyright issues and that Playboy Inc. wouldn't like making <laughs> making a, 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 um, a Playboy couch. So in the end it was a, it was a pink bunny couch and that was really, you know, the, the girls loved that. So there's the game couch. You can actually play PlayStation on this. Um, apparently Lewis gets more requests uh, to actually make this couch and customise it for people, which is obviously really missing the point of the project, but it just goes to show how fantastic the end result is and how much everybody loved it. This is the media coverage of the Prospect Group. So there's Lewis in the background there um, and the girls. They were really, really proud of their work. This is the space um, at the exhibition. So Lewis and the kids sort of made a living room sort of environment where the couches were all displayed. This is some festival goers on the bunny couch, obviously very, very popular with young girls. This is out at uh, New Pika, so people um, moving through the festival were able to sit on the couches and listen to the stories. Some people stayed for hours just, just cuddling up and listening. There are the girls again. Uh, there's the Commissioner and Sheila Magazda from um, uh, the Perth Festival presenting all the awards. There we go. Does anyone have any questions or comments at this point? We can take a few minutes. If anyone wants to type anything, they can just type in the message box here. Looks like everyone's going along okay. Rosie and Debbie, did you mean to type anything there? It doesn't look like anything's come through, but they look like a fabulous idea. Yeah, it's really, really popular. Um, extremely, yeah. They're a really great project and it's great that we've got one in the foyer. If people have come to the office before, I know Kay maybe not you so much being in Northern, but um, it's really great having the pink bunny couch here. It's, it gets a lot of looks and a a lot of attention. All right, I think I'm going to move on to the next one now. This is the Department for Community. So this is another um, this is another sort of quite big scale consultation, or sorry, participation example that has quite a high profile end in sight, I suppose. So National Youth Week enabled young people aged 12 to 25, so that's quite a broad age range, to have the chance to showcase their talents, be involved with creativity and engage in issues. The department was very clear that they wanted um, National Youth Week to be youth led, so they really gave young people the opportunity to have ownership and responsibility over the project. There were nine core members and 40 in the wider group aged, 70, aged 17 to 25. The individual young people took responsibility for promotion and event management and they were supported all the way through by adult coordinators and um, as is the case with a lot of high profile events they were formally recognised by the Minister for Youth and many have actually found the involvement useful for their future employment and study. They've actually been able to go on um, to do other things with those skills. Some of the roles that they actually took on, they were social media um, managers, they actually managed the Twitter and Facebook book interactions, they coordinated the film competition moderation, they managed the design con components of the market, uh, they did event management duties and volunteering and support roles. Um, just quickly as well, um, once the committee was actually up and running, one of the things they did was where they used all of these skills was that they developed partnerships with a number of organisations to get a number of separate projects off the ground. So they worked with Propel Youth Arts to run the Kickstart Youth Market. They also worked with Student, Student Edge to run an online film festival and they worked with Cultural Infusion to run a hip hop festival too. So that was a really good outcome.
Um, Debbie, if you're getting patchy audio, you can call in on the phone number. Um, call in at any time if it's a little bit sketchy. Um, the number is 63118988 and you should just get patched straight through if you call on the phone. So that option is available to you and you just need to put in your participant code again, um, which you put in the last time. Okay, the next example is the Serpentine Jarrodale Shire and their Youth Advisory Committee. Since 2009 now, the YAC has been involved in implementing the strategic plan throughout the Shire. It's still going today. It involves um, young people aged 13 to 25. The young people are from five different towns and they attended 14 different high schools and three primary schools. They also, they've got quite a formal structure. Um, they have developed terms of reference as a formal way of recognising how everyone's going to be involved, what their roles and responsibilities are. Um, they also have a dedicated project officer similar to Fremantle Headspace, very, uh, very, very important. Um, this YAC actually has its own budget as well which is um, demonstrating a really significant commitment to the process. find out what the children and young people in the area actually wanted and what things they wanted to participate in. Uh, a major piece of work was completed which was the youth survey and it aimed to find out as much as possible about the activities, interests, uh, barriers to involvement and other areas that the Shire can improve on. It's really helped to prioritise the projects and programs of the Shire. They got about 340 responses to that survey from Eight, from people ages 10 to 25, which was representative, it was about 10% of the population of the Shire, so that's quite significant. Um, since this work has taken place, the YAC still meets regularly. The YAC members report that they feel a great sense of achievement in actually directly influencing the programs that get run throughout the Shire and really having their voice heard. Some of the programs that they've actually developed and run regularly is a project called the Butterfly Project which is a program of activities designed for girls by girls. They also run the Wild Camps Project, an outdoor adventure program that provides young people with an opportunity to do a whole bunch of activities together and to just hang out. They've also extended their Adventure World Project program which was previously just a one-off that happened but now they've made that available um, throughout, the, um, throughout the year when school holidays come. Um, the thing also importantly that they've done is developed a database so that they can widely promote activities to the rest of the kids in the Shire. They've got about 290 young people on that list now so that's really quite a lot of people. Uh, they also get regular feedback about the implementation of the strategic plan so there's that con continuous feedback loop going through to them. How are we going? How are you going Debbie? Uh, hopefully you've got... Hopefully you've got some better audio now. This is the last, um, great Debbie, that's good to hear. This is the last part of the presentation. Um, we've moved through quite quickly so we've, we've actually made up the time and we haven't kept you for more than the allotted time slot so I'm really actually quite happy about that um, even though it was very annoying before. Anyway, what I'd like to talk about is going back to uh, what I was talking about before about the scope of the involvement and how big or how small consultation can actually be. There's a couple of things that I'd like to talk about. Um, some are high level consultations uh, through parliamentary inquiries and others are involvement in particular projects or on committees or even just for a small piece of work that still is important but it's very discreet. The first is about high level consultation. Um, the Commission for Children and Young People made submissions to both of these inquiries, the National FISO Inquiry and the Federal Inquiry into Cyber Safety. She actually called on those inquiries to pay specific attention to submissions received from children and young people and to actually consider meeting directly with representative groups of children and young people to inform their deliberations. The Cyber Safety Inquiry Committee did just that. 
Um, they actually conducted two school forums with high school students and online surveys. They um, got 34,000 children and young people on their online survey to respond, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and the FIFO inquiry actually took on that advice as well. The FIFO inquiry heard specifically from children and young people through face-to-face -face consultation. It actually, gave, it actually heard evidence from local high school students at the inquiry up in Karasa and that gave young people a chance to share directly with the committee their views about how FIFO practices have affected them in their communities. There's also um, opportunity for children and young people's advice to be sought on discrete projects. Uh, we use our advisory committees. Uh, we've got one in Northam and we've also got one here in the metropolitan area and we ask them from time to time what they think about publications that the Commissioner is, is writing, what they think about the layout, what they think about the graphic design, what they think about the content, all of those kinds of things. Um, this kind of a, um, advice seeking, it needs to um, it needs to acknowledge, especially if you've been working with a group over a particular amount of time, that their views as they get older will really change. They're also not the same. You need to recognise that they're going to have different views to each other. An example of this is when we sought some feedback from the uh, regional advisory committee from Wild about a document that the commissioner was going to be publishing. The two most interesting pieces of feedback were that as a group of 14 to 17 year olds, they didn't like the publication referring to them as kids, so they really wanted to be taken seriously. They also really liked the fact that the document only had a few cartoon graphics because they, um, they thought that this too many cartoons and too many pictures said to them that people thought they were immature. So that was really, really interesting. It really does just show um, that you need to acknowledge a range of views and that you need to not necessarily, you need to be prepared for the fact that kids' views are going to change. So that's the last of my presentation. I would like to open up now if anyone has got any suggestions or they want to share any examples. Um, if anyone's got any questions about the application of the guidelines, if anyone wants to share a challenging or a positive example, if you guys are um, using social media to actually involve children and young people, if you have any examples of that, if it's something that you're averse to, um, yeah, just opening it up for a couple of minutes of discussion or we can, we can end here. Uh, it's up over to you guys. Yeah, thanks Kay. So that's a question about how to encourage local governments to use social media. It is it is really, really, really tricky. Um, actually right here, the Subiaco Council, they have a really good example that somebody shared with us in the last participation workshop. They, um, they used it to conduct a live poll um, yeah, there is a social media forum happening later on in the year. Um, so basically uh, the Subiaco Council had a big event, it was like a street event, and they used social media to actually ask young people. They just had um, questions rolling up on, um, on Facebook, I think it was, and people were actually able to, um, they were actually able to answer those questions that were coming up on the spot and then they were able to collate the answers at the end of the at the end of the event. So I can actually give you some um some contacts if you like. It is something that we'll be talking about um later on in the year. So um and it's we're focusing more on young people in this example with using social media, but it can be a really good way of um of conducting um meetings, um getting people on working groups, those kinds of things. So I'd really encourage you if you can't come to the workshop to come to the webinar that we'll be doing um that follows the social media workshop. So Rosie, I hope that um that answers your question. Thank you. So Debbie 
Let's go to Debbie's question first, which I'm just trying to go back to. Okay, if we can just go on Debbie's question. So Debbie would like to involve, involve or advise our Youth Advisory Committee of the guidelines and keen for any advice that could be provided to them on involvement in such projects. So yeah, I, it would be really, really great to share the participation guidelines with your Youth Advisory Committee. Also what we're encouraging, there's a whole bunch of examples, um, there's a whole bunch of examples in the participation guidelines but we're also getting examples from other people as well. We're always asking for examples um, of participation projects so that the Commissioner can publish those on her website. Um, the PMH, um, the PMH Youth Advisory Group Committee would, would be, it would be great. Maybe you could do a participation example um, of their involvement. We've actually got a template that you can fill out um, that outlines um, how people were involved in the process, what kinds of things you considered. So does that answer your question, Debbie? We've got one from Jacinta as well, a question about permission. Since we are asking children and young people to participate and give their input, does permission need to be sought from parents? Absolutely. It absolutely does need to be sought from parents. Um, it's a really, really tricky area. We have, um, we have templates. Uh, there is actually a consent form template in the participation guidelines. It needs to be really, really simple. It needs to be able to be adapted for um, cultural purposes as well. Our Metropolitan Advisory Committee is the Metropolitan Migrant Resource Centre, so we need to be mindful that we're asking people really simple questions. You also need to get permission, express permission from parents to publish photos as well. So we have a permission for joining in, for actually taking part, and then we've got a separate permission that we get um, that we get for photos as well. So we can actually um, share the template with that. There's a whole bunch of templates and examples on the website. Um, but yeah, it really is just a non-negotiable, um, the permission thing. Yeah, the templates and resources are on the website. And if there's anything that isn't on the website that you would like and that you think would be helpful, then you can email me directly and we can actually try and get those to you. Um, the, there is a transcript of, there's a whole recording of this webinar, an audio recording, um, and that is actually, that's recorded for us by Redback Conferencing and that's provided. And then we'll download that and we'll put a link to We'll send a link to you guys absolutely, and then we'll um, I think we'll put it on our website so that people can see that as well. Um, the questions and answers that are posed um, that will all be captured in the audio as well. So I've I've tried to be careful to actually read them back so that people can hear. Um, so I think that answers. Yeah, I can send you the PowerPoint as well. That's not a problem. So yeah, as I said, the PowerPoint will be in the recording. So basically you see a recording exactly of what's happened now. Yeah, I think there's a question about um, under eight down here. Um, Jacinta, that's a really, really good question and it is an area that's, that is actually quite tricky. It's something that um, after feedback from the first workshop, instead of talking, like this sort of talks generally about children and young people, but the focus is really more on young people. So what we're going to do, the second one in November is going to talk more about social media and young people. And the one that we're planning for next year will be really talking about um, about participation with children. Um, I'm not sure about under eight years, but um, definitely we'll be trying to um, we'll be trying to get some examples and some some tips and ideas on consulting with really young children.